Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for coming here this morning. Uh, I'm super, super excited to have Kirby Woodson and Laura Chang here today. A couple of years ago, almost 50% of my holiday cards are from Tiny Print, so this is super amazing and I'm really excited. Thank you so much for being here. Um, the workshop is going to have three parts, so first there's going to be time for a chat and Q&A, and girls, there will be time for you to ask questions. Uh, so just be thinking, and at the end, you can raise your hand and ask any questions. Um, after that, we're doing an activity where we're designing and brainstorming ideas for different holiday cards. And then there will be time for my favorite activity, which is food. And uh, there's, it's just going to be a lot of fun, so let's dive in. So thank you so much for being here. Um, can you just start maybe by telling me a little bit about yourself? Where did you grow up, and how did you get into design? Well, I think on behalf of Karina, I just thank you also for having us. We've been watching you grow this organization over the past year plus, right? And just I think it's amazing to have this kind of asset and do this with the girls in our community. So hats off to starting thank something you. so amazing. Um, I'll start. I was um, born and raised in Hawaii, grew up there all my life, um, with a lot of uh, came from a big tight knit family, a lot of aunts and uncles close by. And I was really close to um, all four of my grandparents. Both my grandfathers were entrepreneurs. Um, one of my grandparents, my grandfather, started a local airline company, and he would take me to school every day. And so throughout the drives, I'd learned a lot about the ups and downs of starting a business. And then my other grandfather started a construction company, and I would work there in the summers, I remember, over high school, kind of following in his footsteps and learning about that. So needless to say, I think there's a lot of entrepreneurial spirit in my family. Um, the funny thing is that when it came to my generation, my cousins, my brother, my sister, they all decided to be lawyers. So I was the youngest of the bunch, and I said, I want to be different. So um, I decided to study economics at Stanford. And then about a few years later, I went back to Stanford for business school. Um, and all throughout that time, I never had a crystal clear idea about what I wanted to be when I grew up. There's never an aha moment. There's kind of this common theme about things that I love. One was that I've always loved great design and fashion. And then the other was that I was always fascinated with consumer products. So products that we kind of use on our everyday basis. Uh, and so I set out to work for companies like Levi Jeans, the jean company, uh, Williams-Sonoma, um, and then Walmart, uh, selling everything from soap to jewelry to electronics. Uh, and then after about four years, I was in the online division helping Walmart launch their website. Um, I kind of Something felt like it was missing, and I thought, you know, I don't think this is for me long term. And what you should know about some place like Walmart, Walmart, it's an amazing place. You know, there's people from store associates to people that work, you know, to build a website. But there's millions of employees, and so it could feel very slow. You know, if I had a great idea that I thought was great, I'd take it to my boss, and then he or she would say, okay, let me think about it, I'll take it to that boss, and then that boss, and ultimately to the CEO of the company. And many times the answer would be, a yeah, great idea, but we're going to not do it, or let's do it in two years. So it just felt very slow to me, and I'm kind of the person that wants to actually be doing things, not just strategizing and planning ahead. And so I said, no, I want to start my own company. I want to call my own shots and kind of control my own destiny, for better or worse, own successes as well as the failures. And luckily around that time, um, a few of my business school classmates had a similar feeling. And so we set out to figure out what kind of company we wanted to start. So soon after that came the birth of Tiny Prince. That was back in 2003. Um, and let me tell you a story about how it started really quickly. So about that time, my now husband Eric and I were um, engaged and planning our wedding. And we needed to find wedding invitations to send to our guests. So the process back then, back in the early 2000s, was we drive to our local store, Stanford Mall, go into the papyrus, the local stationery store, go to the back of the store, look through these heavy albums with hundreds of designs and compare. And after a few hours, we kind of settle on a design that was fine. I didn't love it, which sort of looked different, but that was all I got. Call the store associate and say, okay, this is the writing. This is what we want on our card. Eric and Laura would love for you to be at their wedding, blah, blah, blah. And she'd write it all on a piece of paper. And we put in a little request, like, can you make this font bigger? I wish that you could make this in this font type. Make all these special requests. And then she'd fax it back to the printer. 
Does anyone even know what a fax is? <laughs> yeah, it's such an outdated word. It's, it was an old way for us to send information from one place to the next. Nothing having to do with computers. And a lot of times when you fax something, it would get through to that printer and so it gets stuck and crazy back and forth process that took days. So we sent the fax back. About a week later, it come back. We would see our proof. Oh my goodness, they spelled Eric's name wrong, and the etiquette was wrong, all these wrong things. Okay, we do it, fax it back and forth. It was just a really broken, long, time-consuming process. So my question to you would be, can anyone tell me a few things, like how we would do things differently today? Yes? Um, we'd use computer editing to make certain changes. That way we could have our, um, our cards and any other paper mm -hmm. we'd need in a specific way. Great idea. Anything else, Neil? I've seen like um, websites where they allow you to choose from a template, and you kind yeah. of design a little bit of it. Right. So it's like what you want. Exactly. So those were two great ideas, and some of the things that went into us starting Tiny Print. We basically wanted to take the papyruses of the world and bring it online, have better designs, better personalization tools, easier ways to send people information faster. Um, and so we started. One problem was one of the key things about Tinyfence that we knew we wanted was great designs. And I have to say, I, I had a vision about what that meant, about the, the sensibility, how the styles of the designs. But I myself am not a designer, and I didn't. I needed help. I needed help. I needed great talent. Around that time, a friend says, you need to call Kirby Woodson. She has this amazing brand, Petite Alma, and she can help you get started. So luckily, we made some phone calls, and Kirby was the first designer at Tiny Prints, so critical to helping us get off the ground and kind of execute these great designs and put Tiny Prints out there. And so when Manat asked me to speak, I said, I'd love to speak, but I really need to bring Kirby with me, because she's another piece of the puzzle that I think you'll be so excited to meet and you know get to know, and she's going to lead our design process later, but I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Yes. Um, so yeah, so I, uh, well, I'll back up a little bit. I grew up in Texas. Um, I moved to New York right out of school. Um, I decided I was a fashion design major. So I moved to New York and I designed for Baby Gap, doing uh, designs for their little girls. And um, I then moved to Paris and worked for a French company there called Bonpoint. Um, I was designing what they call naissance, which is a uh, newborn. So think of any baby that you're cradling that's still that tiny. Um, that sounds so fancy. <laughs> <laughs> I know, doesn't it sound better in French? <laughs> um, so um, I did that for a while, and while I was in Paris, I, um, I discovered these wonderful pens. Um, they had the tie, they almost look like a needle that you would see at the doctor's office. They're so, so thin, so you can write really, really tiny and detailed, and I was obsessed with these pens. And I started doodling with them and making birthday cards for people, or someone would have a baby, because I, I specialized in the baby industry. So I would make these, and finally the woman that owned the company saw some of them, and she said, um, can you make some of those for our checkout counter? When people are checking out, they'll have a gift card that they can get for their for their gift and attach it. Um, so that's how I started doing card design. So I came back to the States, I came back to New York, and I worked for um, uh, Marie Chantal, which is a, a small clothing design company in New York. And then on the side, I started doing the cards. And um, one thing kind of led to another. I was actually designing uh, still children's clothing for a Belgian woman. And um, that's when Laura and her team reached out to me. And so I was kind of doing two things at once. Um, which is, is one of the things that I would always, what I would tell people, our young entrepreneurs, is always keep your day job. You know, until you, until you get something up and running, keep your day job. So I continued to work for these Belgian women while I started working with Tiny Prince. Um, I then got a little studio, my own studio in New York, uh, on the Lower East Side, this tiny little wonderful studio, which, you know, was, seemed so expensive at the time that you couldn't even find, you know, like a, a curbside in New York to sell for that price. Um, we had a little mouse that came in and out. Um, and it was just your typical New York experience. And um, when I joined with Laura, I just started designing and working for them. And um, Tiny Prince started to grow pretty rapidly. 
And um, so I realized that um, I could only do so much as far as design. And there were a lot of other uh, techniques and design styles that would work well that I wasn't capable of doing. So um, I started hiring people to help me with some designs. Um, somehow I ended up always hiring foreigners. I don't know why I was attracting that crowd, but the first uh, young woman I hired was from London. She came in and worked with me. She still works with me. Um, the next one was Australian. Uh, the next was from Thailand. <laughs> so we, we joked because in our office we felt like we had a, a, a little petite United Nations <laughs> at Petite <laughs> Alma. Um, so, so yeah, I've been working um, with Tiny Prince and now Shutterfly, who acquired them, uh, for 15 years. Can you believe that? Uh, 15 years, and then um, I moved from New York out here to California. I actually live out in Marin County, about an hour from here. And um, I launched a new company when I moved out here. It's called Studio Birdsong, and I teach design lessons to young girls. And the concept is design skills or life skills, and everybody can be creative. You don't have to be a designer to be creative. So uh, currently, I still run Petit Alma, but I have a lot of people that help me do that. Um, and then I, I do bird song out in the wind. So. Super cool. So starting and working with small companies obviously has a lot of challenges. What are just some struggles you had along the way, and how did you deal with them? Can you start? It? Sure. I think like the biggest challenge for Tiny Prince is that we're unfunded. So what that means is that no one wanted to give us money to start a company. Uh, a lot of companies out here, when you have an idea, you take in outside money. People that help you, you know, at first pay to hire the right people, enough people to spend money on marketing. Um, but I remember back in the early 2000s when three, uh, my two co-founders and I were thinking about this idea. We, we you know, share with investors or our family, and we kind of get that nice, you know, cordial grin, but no one, you know, a lot of people thought it was a bad idea. Um, no one thought that it would really take off. And so what we did was we pulled $10,000 of savings, which really is anything to start a company when you're competing against established players like Paul Mark or Papyrus, and we set off. And so I think one of the biggest lessons of that um, is that we just need to be scrappy. We need to be cheap, lean, and efficient. Um, one of our mantras at the company was every dollar counts, and literally every dollar counted. We started this company out of my uh, apartment. Well, you know, our son Nate was kind of playing in another room at that time. We, I tried to be fulfilling orders, and then we moved to a, um, a, 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 a space without any windows above a Chinese restaurant on Capture Street with <laughs> building our own IKEA furniture, or getting used furniture, you know, for free, that type of thing. And I think that just kind of, that, sentiment and that culture stayed throughout our company and just making sure that we negotiate the best deals, that we, you know, are really um, frugal with our money. And what was it like for you to see Tiny Prince then grow into such a successful company? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a dream. It was a dream, it's a dream job, you know, in terms of just um, the pride. You know, one of the reasons why we built the company was just to have that sense of accomplishment and for me to be doing that with a few of my friends and doing it together and succeeding. I mean, there's a lot of ups and downs, but I think just the feeling, I think, of being able to do it with your friends and for your employees, that's what I think I take away most from the experience. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, I would say as far as challenges go for having a small business, um, like Laura was saying, no one really wants to work with you because you don't have people that are following you yet, you don't have a, a big business. And so you kind of have to beg people to work with you. When I was in the children's industry, the clothing industry, um, the Belgian women that I worked for, it was a new business for them. Um, it's the woman who brought us, there's a brand called Petit Bateau, that's a really famous French brand, and uh, she brought that brand to the United States and she wanted to start her own brand, so she hired me to design for it. And, um, you know, our, our orders were so small at the beginning that none of the factories would take us on. So it's really, that part is really difficult. And finally, you start selling and, it, you know, you get a little bit of credibility and things grow. But um, you've got to get used to the word no <laughs> because you're going to hear it a lot. Um, and you've got to just pick yourself up and start at it again. 
that's what I would say. So, I mean, hearing the word no repeatedly, did you ever doubt yourself or feel like you couldn't do it, or were you always just confident? Yeah, well, I think one, one, one thing Laura mentioned, she was working with two of her friends from business school. Um, that's really helpful because if someone says no to you, you have your two other friends that kind of, uh, you know, you're in it together. Whereas if you do it just by yourself and you hear no consistently, it beats you up a little bit more. Um, I've always done Petidama by myself. Um, I certainly wish that I had a partner at times. Um, and I think that the next venture I do, I'll definitely do it with a partner. Yeah, probably easier, easier to like share some, yeah. make someone else do the work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what role has confidence played in both of your successes? Um, I would say, you know, I always try to think of courage instead of confidence, because sometimes I think confidence can be a little bit hollow. Um, I, I, we all know um, people who are highly, highly confident but actually aren't getting things done, um, or maybe aren't as capable as other people. Um, and I, I guess that would be more ego. But um, what I like about the word courage is that um, you know, none of us are fearless. People say, oh, you should, you know, he's fearless, she's fearless. We're not. But if you can feel the fear and do it anyway, that's courage. And that's what builds confidence. So um, I think um, just being courageous and believing in myself and trying to continue. Like, you've got to remember those little wins. Because every time you get a little win, you can kind of pat yourself on the back and think, I can do the next thing and the next thing. I can move to Paris, and I can do this. But you can't do those things unless you have the little wins in there. And each little win gives you a little more courage, and then more confidence. Mm -hmm. I should probably that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll be honest, for me, confidence or courage is a work in progress. There are days that I feel really confident in what I'm doing, and other days not so much. So even at my age, it's ever evolving. Um, but there's several things that have helped as I've, you know, throughout the years. One, I'm a big believer that if you work really hard and you feel prepared, then you'll be a ton more confident. Um, when I reflect back from my school to my education to wherever I worked, I always felt like I was amongst a lot of high achievers, people that were better than me. But I always fell back on if I was willing to put in the work that I could, I could do it. Um, you know, in high school, I would be the one that if a teacher handed out an essay assignment, um, I'd work on it as soon as she gave the assignment out and then do a first draft and then go to see the teacher to get feedback, take it back and revise. And revise. You know, like, I was a planner so that by the time I had it in, it, it, I feel really confident that I'd do well. Um, at Tiny Prince, I, one of the scariest things that I was asked to do many times was to handle the company's PR. That's public relations. So when companies want to talk to you, we, we can have the opportunity to market our company by talking to news reporters or being on television. So much nerves in me, right? Um, but instead of kind of just sitting in my nerves, you know, I force myself to practice my presentations. I pull my husband in or stand in front of a mirror and ask, ask me just random questions because you don't know what you're being thrown at. And that would just boost my confidence so much more. So I'm a big believer in just, you know, um, working hard to, to achieve the result. And then just looking back a couple, or not a couple, a few years, and just seeing where Tiny Prince was, and or where Tiny Prince is now, and where T. Elma is, is there any advice you'd give yourself um, in middle school for confidence and just for success? I, I think I would say whenever you're doubting, just have that voice in your head that says, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Because you can get into this spiral of, well, this is going to happen, and this is going to, and get really nervous about it. But if you just keep, uh, I think that inner dialogue that you have with yourself is really important. And if you're saying, oh, I saw, or I did so badly at that, or um, that doesn't help. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I could learn that. Make sure that little voice is actually yeah. saying nice things. Like, it would, Sometimes what your voice is saying to you, you would never say to a friend. Yeah. If your friend went for an interview and they didn't get it, you would never say, you didn't get it because you're so stupid. <laughs> you know, you would never say that to a friend, so don't, don't say it to yourself. Yeah. And I think related to that is, um, I'm a big proponent in find people that are your biggest cheerleaders. 
I think that makes all the difference. When I think about growing up and there's a few teachers or coaches that believed in me. Um, and so I think you're at the age where you can figure out who those people are. Who are the friends that make you feel better, that are your cheerleaders or family members? And sit close by them because a lot of it is just that extra boost of encouragement. You can do it. It's just people that are also telling you you can do it. And then Kirby, what advice would you give to girls who want to go into design and do art? Well, I think the shocker in design is that there's not a lot of design in design. A lot, if, especially if you have your own business. About 90% of my business is uh, the business part, and then 10% is actually designing. So, um, but I think, um, you know, I would just say practice. Whatever it is that you love doing, and practice doing. There's so many ways to learn now. You can take online classes. You can go to Creative Line and learn how to use Adobe Photoshop or do, you know, so many things like that that we didn't have access to when you were growing up. Um, so um, it's really the hours that you put into it. Awesome. So, girls, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? Do you ever regret starting that um, tiny print because, like, for any reason? No, I, I, I have left tiny prints. I've been out of business for a few years now, and I, I miss it every day. You know, it, it grew up to be a different company, and there's, it make, you know, there's reasons why I left. But if anything, I think I regret, you know, leaving such a special place. Um, so I wouldn't trade anything just for the ups and downs. And like I said before, I think the feeling of um, accomplishing something and the ownership that you can, you know, that you feel in starting your own company is is amazing. It's uh, contagious. Like you kind of just want to keep doing it again and again. Yeah. What was the biggest part that motivated both of you? Oh gosh. I would I would say I just I loved doing what I was doing. I mean. When I was in France and I was making those cards, I was just doing that for fun. That wasn't because I had been asked to do it and then someone saw it and said, oh, we should sell this at the counter. So it was kind of a combination of I was doing something I really loved and then um, I started to feel like I was pretty good at it. And then um, I started realizing, wow, there's a business here. I could actually do this and have fun at work rather than just be sitting behind the computer all day. Um, so it was, you know, I guess I was enjoying it. I think as the company grows for Tiny Prints, you know, we're lucky to grow to the point where we had 400 plus employees. And so after a certain time, your motivation shifts from wanting to do it for yourself to not wanting to let your amazing, had an amazing employee base. That really felt one of our other kind of mantras was uh, treat each other like family. And so we had this vision of creating a company where it really did. You know, sometimes people say, you should, that's not the right type of feeling a relationship you should have at a company, but I, that's what I enjoyed. I felt like we were able to achieve that, and so um, just not wanting to let them down at the end of the day. Um, well, if you had wanted to start a business, and um, at first, like, it doesn't just shoot up really fast, mm -hmm. so um, do you have, like, did you have another, like, job to keep up your life, and what did you do about it? Because maybe that job wasn't your favorite thing to do, but that's what you had to do. I did. I, when I was working with Tiny Prince, I was designing for the Belgian woman I spoke about earlier. Um, and gosh, this, this was so crazy. Um, I had been working with her for a little over a year. We had just gotten our collection into Barney's, which is a, a really big deal in New York. Um, and the woman was much older. And um, she had a seizure and was having these health issues. And her granddaughter, who was helping run the business, said, you know what, I don't really want to do this. And so they, like, within a couple of weeks of getting that order at Barney's, closed the business down. And that was my main source of income. <laughs> and I had just moved back to New York. I had just signed a new lease, um, basing it on the income I would be making from her. Um, so I had to scurry about and go find all the friends that I used to work with at The Gap. And so I started freelancing at Oshkosh um, with some friends from The Gap who were there. And I just... 
I got scrappy. <laughs> you know, I started looking for freelance jobs here and there and doing that. And then at the same time, I was working with Laura. And then that started to rev up. And once that revved up, then I stopped doing, you know, more of the freelance things. I stopped for, uh, I was unpaid for over a year. Um, but I kind of, I had in mind a, a number of, okay, if this is going to work out in two years, I just really need to get back to and find another job. I think at that time, my other two partners kept their jobs, and we were kind of moonlighting, meaning they are just doing it on the side. But we needed to really kind of commit to having at least one person spend full time, or else, um, you know, someone, another company might have taken over. But I will say one thing. I think that when you're starting off, one piece of advice is um, don't be a perfectionist. Right? Like you really need to, when you're a startup, you've got to move quickly. You've got to test a lot of things. It's so easy when uh, we're creating the website for me to obsess about the perfect font, right? Or the perfect image or the logo. But you can't waste time on all the details. You need to test something and then iterate, get feedback from your customers, and then improve whatever they care about. Maybe they don't care about the perfect logo. They care about great designs, right? And don't give up too quickly. I see so many ideas where you give up because you don't have enough small wins. You lose your confidence, yeah. and then it's gone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. On a scale of 1 to 10, how was starting your own business? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Um, sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, I would say it goes 1, 10, 1, 5. Yeah, so like, sure. it, it hops all over the place. There's definitely days when um, I would feel like, oh, this is never going to work out. And then there's other days when I think, like, this is going to be the greatest next company. Um, so it, it bounces up and down, and it never stays anywhere too long. you got to remember that. When you're up, it doesn't stay there too long. When you're down, it doesn't stay there too long. So just get ready to ride away. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to put it. Kirby, I mean, I think um, it's easy to look back and say 10, right? But there's so many ups and downs. Um, it's... It's a roller coaster. I think you just need to kind of fasten your seatbelt and get ready for the ride. But, yeah. And even the biggest, most successful companies have, you know, small failures within the business. Um, I remember we had Buttercup. Kids. Yes, remember that? So many. Yes. There was when Tiny Prince began. They started a division called Buttercup Kids, and it just it just didn't go out. out. Yeah. And so it just kind of quietly faded away. Right. But. When people look at Tiny Trends, they don't even know about Buttercup Kids. But every business, Apple, Nike, all those new ones, they have things like that. It doesn't work out. And, um, you know, I don't believe you can call anything a failure unless you didn't learn from it. And so um, we learn from it and move on. Yes. <laughs> I love that. That's a really good way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. What is your favorite thing about starting your own company? So, this may seem a little bit off. When I first heard Tiny Prince, it was to get more flexibility. I knew I wanted to start a family and have more freedom as to not only calling the shots, but kind of, yes, working hard, but on my own hours. Um, and of course, there's some truth to that. I don't. I think starting your company requires a ton of hours, much more than I would ever put at a corporate job, you know, a big company. Um, but I still think that is something that I appreciate about my time at Tiny Prince, was that um, I was able to raise, there's Sophie here in the corner, one of my daughters, and my son. It's just that um, we were able to um, kind of do things, like I said, on my own terms. and know that I was putting um, the time that I wanted to put towards work. It was the time that I wanted in terms of being efficient, what I wanted to work on. Um, and I think that just kind of being able to control your own destiny is my favorite thing. I think for me, um, I guess I would say some of it is the pride I take in, in things that I build. Um, like I said, I grew up in Texas and um, in an environment where, um, I hate to say it, but it, it wasn't thought of that I would actually grow up and do something uh, impactful. And um, there was definitely that little bit in me that kind of wanted to say, hey, I can work and I can do that. Um, and I can do the same thing that the boys are doing, or I can do the same thing my brother's doing. So um, for me, it feels really good to be able to say, um, I have a business that I love, and um, it's, I, I have a lot of pride about that. That's awesome. So if you have any more questions, 
Uh, you can hold them. We're going to have time during the food portion for you to come and ask Laura and Kirby. I think now is a good time to transition into the activity. Right. Should we start with the brainstorming? Let's start. Can you do the, the PDF? Yeah, if you do them in the uh, order that yeah. I gave them, so the sure. version of that art and meditation so you can use the PDF. Okay. Yes. So we might want to start. Should we get them at tables? Yeah. Um, why don't you kind of get to a place where you can find some place to just write, and I will pass out some papers. I wanted to do like a holly thing theme, and so I did Happy Holly Day, and I kind of decorated the um, the words and the holly with um, like the silver. And I was going to draw like a present on the back of the card, but I didn't. So, yeah. Yeah. so for mine, I did um, We Are Spread More Holly Dolly Christmas. So I did I Don't Know, There Will Be Some Now in front. And then the second, and then in the middle, I did So Have a Cup of Cheer.